Okay, we're going to conclude with a couple of case studies to give you an idea of how we put this into clinical practice. And uh, this is a 50-year-old patient who became sick in 2002, and the initial onset of symptoms were pain between his shoulder blades in the upper thoracic area and his trapezius. And this pain continuously increased over a two-year period to the point at which if he lifted anything heavier than 10 pounds, he would get immediately increased neck pain and it would trigger a full-blown migraine. So here's an indication in which the most minor degree of muscular effort is a trigger for a severe inflammatory process that involves the nervous system, the muscular system, and the circulatory system. Right? Migraine is thought to be related to vascular inflammation and nerve inflammation. There are some researchers that think that migraines are almost like a special form of a seizure disorder. That's primary a neurological issue. There are other researchers that believe it's more vascular in nature, and certainly we can see the possibility that's a combination of both of those. By 2008, he's developed restless leg syndrome, which is another neurovascular complication in which there is an inflammation of the vascular system, there's an inflammation of the nervous system, and this creates this restless leg syndrome, which then creates more sleep disturbances, which then creates higher levels of inflammation, and this whole thing spirals out of control to the point at which patients are completely dysfunctional. At the time of his initial visit, the current symptoms are shortness of breath, palpitations, insomnia, memory loss, headaches, whole body pain that's worse when he sits. So we talked earlier about the idea that we can divide the pathological process into yin and yang. It's either hitting the cardiorespiratory system above the diaphragm or it's hitting the gastrointestinal system below the diaphragm. And here we can see that the primary focus of pathology and symptoms is upper respiratory in nature. Shortness of breath, palpitations, heart and lungs. Insomnia, memory loss, it's the cognitive component. Headaches, whole body pain, that's the musculoskeletal component. So we're going to be looking at this situation in relationship to respiratory pathogens and the clearance of those as the primary issue. More history. 30 to 45 plane flights a year for the past 10 years. Invariably, somebody with an air travel history like this, these are the worst case scenarios for chronic fatigue syndrome, ongoing autoimmune diseases, and neurological illness. Two years ago, he had an old silver filling replaced. His surgical history includes tonsillectomy, a ruptured Achilles tendon that required surgery, and a radiofrequency ablation of a facet joint that included neurolysis. So he, in relationship to his chronic back pain problems, they did an ablation of a facet joint and destroyed the nerve that was causing him the pain. He does not take alcohol, he does not drink coffee, he does not smoke. He's allergic to penicillin, cat dander, dust, pollens, and he's intolerant of Mirapex. Mirapex is an anti-Parkinson's drug that's oftentimes prescribed for restless leg syndrome. He could not tolerate that medication. His current pharmaceuticals are Xanax, which is an anti-anxiety drug, Celebrex, which is a COX-2 inhibitor, and Ultram, which is a pain reliever. What we're now going to see is the way that I go through a diagnostic procedure in my practice. And in addition to looking at the patient's signs and symptoms and taking a thorough history, looking at their tongue and feeling their pulse, I also do a palpatory examination of acupuncture points by running my fingers along the channels looking for reactive acupuncture points. And these reactive acupuncture points can manifest in different ways. They can manifest in terms of the patient's subjective sensation of the point being tender to pressure. And that's the idea of, of using palpation as a diagnostic skill. Um, or we can do it based on the subjective response of the practitioner themselves, that as they run their hands over the point, they feel that this, the tissue around the point is sticky or swollen or has nodules or granules or uh, there's different structural abnormalities at the point that indicate that the tissue is disturbed in that area. 
And there is a wonderful book that was just recently published called Application of Chinese Application of China, of Channel Theory in Chinese Medicine. It's a big hardback volume, uh, and I can't recall the author's name, but it's just an amazing, amazing piece of literature that discusses this idea of channel palpation as being the most important diagnostic modality for acupuncturists. On a very simple level, you can run your fingertips along the channel and as an example, with this gentleman with a lung pathology, we might run our fingers along the lung channel and find that, gee, the, at lung five, that point has a different uh, sensation and different palpatory quality than all the other points on the channel. And this can help us to identify and confirm what the symptoms are already telling us. We already know this guy's got lung problems. He's short of breath and he's got palpitations and he doesn't sleep. We don't need to have anything more sophisticated than that piece of information to know that we need to address the lungs. But here we're going to talk about the relationship between two acupuncture points. And this is one of the ways that I understand the acupuncture system, is that we can look at the acupuncture system not just in, as a single point, but as a relationship between two points or two channels. And one of the things that I've done in my clinical practice is to use Omura's by digital O-ring test in combination with biological materials to determine more accurately what the significance of certain acupuncture points are. And here, oh, we're going to describe some of those. LI10, large intestine 10, is the point that I use for determining the presence of IgG antibodies. I believe in the work of um, Kiku Matsumoto. There's a, some Japanese practitioners that have certain speci uh, special points for autoimmune diseases that are very close to LI10 in their proximity. And you'll find that patients with musculoskeletal inflammation oftentimes have significant tenderness at this point. And so we can look at that in relationship to gallbladder 34, the master point for the muscles and tendons, and talk about the fact that there can be antibody deposition on joints causing muscle pain and inflammation. In this situation, this autoimmune response is to jet fuel exposure. And the herbs that we used are all pain relieving and anti-inflammatory, acanthopanax, which is used for wind damp conditions, nedium and corydalis, which are for blood stagnation, asparagus and peony, which have yin tonifying effects. And the effect of any chemical exposure is always to cause yin deficiency because of the drying nature of solvents and petrochemicals. Lufa is used for musculoskeletal problems and also clears the lungs. And taxilis or loranthus sangjisheng is also used for yin deficient musculoskeletal pain states. Then the next pathway of pathology is between yin tong and kidney six. And this for me is the, are the two points related to the brain, the cerebrum as a whole at yin tong, and then kidney six for the spinal cord. And this happens to be related to the neurotoxic effects of jet fuel exposure, how jet fuel creates a toxic effect on nervous system function. Here we're using gentiana macrophylla, qin jiao, sigisbechia, xishan sao, and ganoderma, ling jiu. Ganoderma, we've seen before, has anti-herpes virus effects. It protects the nervous system. Uh, and it's used for a condition that we no longer see, uh, a term that's no longer used in Western medicine, but it's still used in Chinese medicine. It's called neurasthenia, which means weakness of the nervous system. Now we would, in Western medicine, we usually classify that as clinical depression. But uh, the Chinese are still using this uh, term of uh, neurasthenia to describe insomnia, fatigue, and cognitive problems. At lung 9 and stomach 12, you can detect pathologies related to a bacterial infection in the lungs, the source of his shortness of breath. And here we're using physalis, pile zaitsal, and pusidanum, chan hu, which we've seen pusidanum has this activating effect on ATP channels. So this is an herb that's not only going to clean the lungs, but clear the lungs, but it's also going to benefit the production of ATP and the flow of ATP through the system. And then another series of autoimmune disorders. REN20, Hua Gai, is the acupuncture point that I use for measuring thymus function and T cell function. And in relationship to gallbladder 34, this describes how the T cells are attacking the muscles and joints. Stomach 12 to gallbladder 34 is related to how the lungs Right, stomach 12 is a point at the apex of the lung. It's not on the lung channel, 
but the classical lung channel does run through stomach 12. And in fact, this is a very important point for detecting lung infections that don't show up on the classical lung channel points themselves, as are the back shoe points. Now, the back shoe points in traditional Chinese medicine, bladder 13 is the point for the lungs, but anatomically, anything from bladder 11 to 17 is anatomically over the lung area. And so any of those points can be indicative of the presence of an infection in the lungs. But here we're looking at T cell responses and lung responses to heavy metals, mercury, chromium, nickel, and vanadium from dental work and air travel. Now the mercury came from the fillings. The chromium and the nickel and the vanadium came from the jet engines themselves. And petrochemicals, all gasoline, diesel, all petrochemicals have heavy metals in them. So when you're burning jet fuel, you're also burning chromium, nickel, vanadium, and other heavy metals, which then re-enter the passenger compartment by the recirculation of the air, and this ends up getting deposited in the lung tissue, where it creates secondary autoimmune responses. The uh, neutralizing herbs here were Maletia, Ji Shui Teng, and Smilax, Tu Fu Ling, which we've already seen is important in heavy metal detoxification. So the response to this first prescription is that he's reporting an increased level of pain, an increased frequency of migraines, but less shortness of breath. So that tells me that we've had a positive effect on clearing the lung infections, but we haven't done such a good job on reducing the neurological and vascular inflammation. And so on the second prescription, all of the ingredients are changed. We're not going to use any of the herbs that we used on prescription number one. And we're going to go for herbs that have more profound effects on reducing inflammation in the nervous system, like Jianghuang, Curcuma Longa, Oldenlandia, Baihua Xie Xie Tsao, Gambir, Goten. At stomach two, we find evidence for the chronic bacterial sinus infection, which we neutralize with chrysanthemum. And then spleen 10, Shuehai, this is an acupuncture point that I use for measuring monocyte and macrophage functions. So this is related to how the macrophages are attacking the muscles and the joints. We can have multiple pathways by which the immune system attacks muscles, joints, nervous system, and mitochondria. It can be antibodies at LI10. It can be T cells at REN20. It can be macrophages at spleen 10. B cells at spleen 11. And so here we're going to use Wei Ling Xian to reduce this muscle inflammation from the heavy metal exposure. Question? Palpating both points simultaneously. Exactly correct. And I'm looking for a sensation. You, you can, again, it depends on your individual sensitivity. It can either be directly through your tactile response of what's going on at the point, or you can press on the point and ask for the patient's feedback. Um, you may have a more subtle internal response that may, is not so related to tactile responses, but more of a, a, a sensation of how you feel in your own body. There are some practitioners who can put their hands on a patient and feel exactly what the patient is feeling. Uh, so that's certainly a very valuable modality. The idea is not to just limit yourself to three spots on the wrist, but to use every acupuncture point in the entire system as a site for getting information related to diagnosis.